I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, not atypical of SciArc. Uh, this lecture popped up literally in the last uh, day or two. <clears throat> I got a call from uh, the ubiquitous uh, Mr. Gary, who had met with the ubiquitous Mr. Luyanda. Is it? Yeah, sorry. Um, when he went to, when Frank went to speak, I guess in Johannesburg or Cape Town, whatever it was, and apparently had some contact with the equally ubiquitous Mr. Mandela. Um, I, apparently the two of them shared a cell. At least that's how Frank tells the story. So your notoriety precedes you, but of course Gary is telling the story, so I have to divide. <laughs> But uh, I think what, what is a little bit unusual for us, I think in the context of a typical SIARC discourse discussion of America, and in fact, typically North America, or Europe, and typically Western Europe, or East Asia, meaning South Korea, and Beijing, Shanghai, Hangzhou, uh, Shenzhen, et cetera. And, and the discussion of architecture, regardless of who comes through here, sticks very much to those areas. And when you look at what we always discuss as, as the global context of a discourse on architecture, the global context seems so often to have to do with architects who do a particular thing who go various places to do that thing. So, so the variability of the work as a function of the place where it's done is, is less the case than the fact that the work is the work wherever it's delivered. We have, I can't remember a discussion here with any architect uh, who came from Africa and I think for those of us, which is probably damn near everybody now, who watches this, this evolving so-called Arab Spring and the relationship of media tools that, that, that precipitates that, and conceivably a similar thing in America, although with a different flavor and a different tone, which starts at Wall Street and ends up in downtown LA and San Francisco and Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, that seems to be bouncing around too. So there's an exchange of information in various cultures that might also pertain to a discussion of Africa, maybe less so in architecture, but at least involves a discussion of media. And of course, North Africa is a different discussion than Central Africa, which is presumably still a different discussion than the Southern uh, part of, of Africa. But to, to hear from an architect who comes from that vantage point, from a different culture, what are the similarities, what are the differences, what are the issues, what are the political and social and economic issues, and in the end, for a place like SciArc, what, what is the design, or the conceptual design, interest, concern, strategy, all of that, and so we thought, uh, that it would be worth a little bit of our time to listen to someone who we don't typically listen to and to see whether that voice or that vantage point informs us in a way that heretofore we have not been. So uh, thank you for coming and I'd like to welcome Luanda Mapabwa. Well, uh... Good evening. Um, thank you for the introduction. In fact, um, the, the introduction itself um, has, has helped me to, to relax a bit because um, I, I think it is quite interesting when we talk architecture, we try and find a language that we want to use. I'm coming from the south, from South Africa, Cape Town. And um, in fact, uh, talking about meeting the ubiquitous uh, Mr. Frank Gehry um, and uh, having Googled a bit of what PsyArc does, um, I, I had the view that 
what we do is pretty ordinary. But interestingly, even meeting Mr. Gary, uh, we ended up talking quite some interesting things together. So I didn't feel quite ordinary uh, in his presence, though I think we all know that he is um, one of the icons of our time. I'm going to take you through a journey of 30 years in the field of architecture. Uh, I've termed the topic, reflecting on 30 years in architecture, my life, South African politics and the architect. In this case, the architect in me. I come from, well, I don't come from Cape Town. I live in Cape Town. I work there. I run a studio there since 2000. And um, Cape Town is an interesting city uh, because somehow it's always compared to, to San Francisco. Uh, people say it's the San Francisco of Africa. I'm, I'm traveling with my wife, an architect. Um, we met in Berlin and uh, we're working together. We've met a, a friend who's been working in Cape Town, Jeffrey. Um, and we, we're glad to, to meet you, Jeffrey, in your hometown. And um, we'll try and take you back to Cape Town because the work we're speaking about, I think, is the work which will be quite interesting uh, for, for the audience, I would hope. Cape Town's um, architecture is also pretty ordinary, but definitely what is special about it is the setting. And the icons of today in South Africa um, uh, are very much strongly influenced by um, our recent hosting of the World Cup. You see the Cape Town Stadium situated within the city bowl, uh, surrounded or having the mountain as the backdrop. You can see uh, downtown over there. This is a, a residential area called Greenpoint. And uh, as I talk, um, we will talk a little bit about what architecture um, or what influences us as architects. Um, and the discussion will be less about Cape Town per se, but about what architects, architects are dealing with in South Africa today. The, the, the presentation is uh, just a bit of personal history about me, uh, reflecting on some of the things that um, I have experienced, especially in the 70s and 80s, the political upheavals. Um, challenges facing architects, I called it, um, because we are in a democratic South Africa and are actually facing very specific challenges, but which I do not believe are necessarily South African only. And uh, obviously I'm looking at what kind of architect we're looking at in the 21st century, from my perspective. I love traveling, and I'm quite happy to be in LA. It's my first time here. And uh, earlier in the year I was in Chicago, and uh, was in the Millennium uh, Square, or whatever it is called, where I stood next to the Bean, and just next to that was Frank Gehry's open air uh, theater, which was quite interesting as well. So LA for me uh, is an experience um, which I believe is one of the cities I've always been looking forward to visit, and, and the fact that uh, I can speak here today for me is truly special. I run a studio in Cape Town, uh, employing about 20 um, professionals, 12 architects, and what we call in South Africa um, technologists, uh, those who look at um, you know, the technical um, aspects of, of, of architecture. And um, I've been running this since 2000. I studied in Germany, but that will come into the presentation. Where did it all start? I'm born in Umtata, a little town of the Eastern Cape in South Africa. Um, there's little me there with my uh, parents and broader family, brothers and sisters. Um, got educated um, and, and, and completed college in 1976. Uh, this was a very specific year in South Africa where there was a big uprising in Soweto where youth started to express their opposition to apartheid. And, um, and about a thousand students were killed uh, in that uh, uprising. And that actually was to turn the history of South Africa around. I started architecture in 1978, um, when at the time South Africa didn't allow um, architecture to be uh, accessible to black students. I therefore belonged to 
the first generation of uh, black students to be allowed to study architecture in South Africa. And um, this is quite important because in a way my journey is about firstly experiencing South Africa from a point of view of the struggle for democracy, but at the same time my passion for architecture, which took me away from South Africa to Germany, where I eventually studied and completed. And um, therefore, I, I just find it very difficult for me to separate those two. But I will tell you how the politics have influenced my architecture. I come from a part of the Eastern Cape, which is there. And um, South Africa in the past used to be divided into these little patches that were called black homelands, or maybe reserves, in, in, if you use the American language. And uh, this is the same place where Nelson Mandela comes from, um, Tata. And therefore, I grew up in this politically charged environment, uh, where he was always that symbol of resistance. And just to give you a flashback, these are the 70s and 80s, where the, 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 the uh, repression was at its highest in South Africa. And I think the most popular picture is the picture of this young boy, Hector Peterson, who was the first to be killed in that student uprising in 1976. This is a picture that uh, has symbolized the struggle for apartheid against apartheid in South Africa. And I think that picture is actually at the UN as well. I left South Africa in 1986 to go and study in Germany. And I continued my um, relationships with the struggle by being part of the anti-apartheid movement in Germany. And this was just a protest action that, that I was involved in. And um, leaving South Africa in 1986 was after I had been imprisoned for five years on Robben Island, which is the maximum security prison. And uh, this is a prison also where Nelson Mandela was kept. And um, it is one of those things that when you are a young man of 22 and are actually finding yourself imprisoned because of your belief in democracy, where you actually start seeing the world in a different way, you associate with people who actually shape your whole thinking. Um, I would say that I'm, I'm quite proud to be associated with the wisdom of people like Nelson Mandela, who I eventually met later on because at the time I was in Robben Island, he had been moved to another prison. Um, I like to show this picture, this one here, because this is Robben Island um, uh, when you at the entrance. And when I did my thesis in Germany, uh, the theme was called Transformation of Robben Island to an International Center for Peace. And I had to go back and do my research there in 1996. And interestingly, I found that one of the warders who were employed during my time as a prisoner was still on Robben Island working there and was still working as a warder. And for me, this was quite a wake-up call because I had left that place 10 years earlier. I had gone to Germany, educated myself, continued my quest for architecture, and to go back and find this guy still uh, on Robben Island. And um, I think when people talk about how South African politics are schizophrenic, um, I can confirm that because I actually felt sorry for the guy because you know, this is a situation where he represented oppression in a way. But I came back and I found him exactly where he was 10 years earlier. And, and these are the things that make South Africa quite a, a special place. Um, I believe that when we achieved our democracy in 1994, um, the message of reconciliation and, um, and, and democracy was something that was exciting to everybody. And um, it, it, it was some of these experiences which we even as a family experience when we had the opportunity to spend my father's 70th birthday with, with Nelson Mandela at a time when he was the president of the country, where we invited him as a citizen and he came. And um, so that wisdom has been rubbing through 
a lot of people. He has touched many people, directly and indirectly. But um, I graduated in Germany at a time when the Berlin Wall uh, collapsed. And uh, post-grad, I work as an architect, uh, freelance. And uh, I saw Berlin actually being built from that point of separation between East and West. The images that you see here, this is the Potsdamer Platz, as it is called. This is where the commercial heart of Berlin is situated today, and where most of the architects that everybody knows started you know, expressing how they feel about Berlin. There's the Sony Center there, which was built by Helmut Jahn. There is the whole Potsdamer Platz urban design was, uh, the competition was won by Renzo Piano. Richard Rogers built there. Sir Norman Foster was building the, the new German parliament in, that so, in, the, in the same area. Saha Hadid um, built there. This was a time when I was completing my studies. And I was fortunate enough myself to um, start working on very interesting projects. The first project was the Nordic Embassy project, which was a campus of embassies by the Nordic countries. This being Denmark, that being Norway, that is Iceland, that is Sweden, and this is uh, Finland. And they have a building of mutual use, which is a building which uh, showcases all the cultures of the different Nordic countries, where they hold lectures, they've got auditoria, they've got uh, cafeteria, they've got language schools. Quite an interesting concept, which uh, introduced a, a, a pre-oxidized copper wall that basically links the buildings and they are sharing a kind of a common courtyard or concourse. Um, and, and the idea of embassies actually having a public uh, building that is accessible, and that is your line of entry, which basically separates the, the, the internal workings of the embassy and the public. And here there is a uh, kind of a, a public courtyard in front of, of this building for mutual use. One of the things that I find interesting about this particular product, project was that um, for the first time Berlin had to be confronted with building um, with timber, uh, and uh, something which had never been allowed there before. So the companies I, I was working for had to find ways to get the German officials to allow timber construction, and, and this actually broke the ground in that. That had never been done before. And working with uh, Nordic architects, uh, I was a project architect for this building, which is the Danish embassy. And you can see the, the, the kind of very sleek exterior of perforated uh, stainless steel panels, some of them opening, some of them fixed. But you go inside and you actually experience the softer timber work, which you know, symbolizes the kind of architectural approach. And obviously, working in that environment where timber is always dominant, uh, for me, was quite an interesting thing to see how architects take influences from their country. And depending on wherever they build, this is what symbolizes their um, architecture. I was fortunate as an architect to uh, be commissioned together with the first company that I, I formed, which was called MMA Architects. We were commissioned to design the uh, South African Embassy in Berlin, which is this building here. And again, unfortunately, this is, I think we're losing the battery. But the building um, had to represent the new South Africa. And one of the themes we uh, adopted was transparency and, and, and diversity. Uh, by transparency, we realized that South Africa being accepted into the world community of nations, had to demonstrate that. And the building had to, in a sense, show its inside. So we opened the facade, uh, different from many of the embassies that, um, that you see. Um, this is an Indian embassy next to it. And most of the embassies on this street, which is called Tiergartenstrasse, are all kind of introverted. They are kind of dignified towards the street. But we found it quite important that we actually open 
our facade so that we, we can represent what South Africa stands for. The diversity part of it um, was achieved by using various kinds of materials and using or combining art and architecture. Um, we selected sandstone from South Africa, which we actually, oops, sorry, which we actually um, uh, exported to Germany, sandstone, granite from Zimbabwe, which we use in two forms, polished and honed, so that it gives you the two different textures. We took um, a, a, a tradition of rock art, and instead of doing it on stone, we actually sandblasted it on glass to give it a contemporary feel. And uh, we took an old tradition of carving plaster, which is a tradition that is uh, carried out by women artisans who actually, uh, through the years, have perfected the art of carving plaster by freehand. But they do designs which we had to, uh, as architects, actually approve of and then allow them to do their thing in the building. And the interesting thing about this technique is actually that there is no paint used. They take oxides and they mix them into the plaster and they actually um, uh, do the, the forms that you see freehand. And this is one of the exports that we found um, to have actually resonated quite well with the public of Berlin. Um, we believe that embassies um, uh, do have the role to, to represent their countries and their people. So the architecture which um, is applied, I, I believe, has to convey that message as well. So here, sandstone is being combined with some uh, horizontal metal elements that have got a dual role to uh, accommodate the external shading, uh, which you can see there but at the same time to, to give the sandstone a contemporary look. Architecture in Berlin is very public, so the opening of the embassy had to allow the public to actually come and see the building. And for me, it was quite interesting to see the building occupied. And the inside of the building also had to be very open. So we've got a huge atrium, which is kind of the link between all the various departments uh, in the embassy, and in fact, when we opened the building and the embassy staff started working there, um, they still up to, to today say to us that they never realized that architecture can play such a role in the working environment of people because all embassies they had worked on were all cellular departments totally separated from each other. So the transparency I talked about about the building had to be reflected on the interior, on the intent, in, in, interior layouts as well. So people have to see each other. They meet in the atrium because all the public facilities are on the atrium space. And maybe for people who live in the Northern Hemisphere, um, um, uh, these are no new ideas. But for a country like South Africa that has been um, obsessed by security and exclusion, these are major changes to a government department, I mean to a government building. Uh, the opening of the building, as I said, um, was public and we had about 7,000 people on the day coming to view the building. Other projects I've done in Cape Town was a, an extension of the parliament building and uh, some work which I've done at the airport. Things that, you know, we do as architects, kind of more public architecture, that's what I'm involved in. Um, but um, I've also been involved in, in work that transcends architecture, where I was part of a team that was looking after the uh, construction of all the stadiums for the World Cup, 10 of them. And uh, we basically had to make sure that when the World Cup comes, all the stadiums are ready, they are built according to FIFA requirements, and we had to monitor the budgets. I'll take you through this because this is really not uh, entirely uh, the, the, the architecture that I do, but uh, these are the 10 stadiums that we were looking after but we had been involved also in analyzing the, the, the World Cup in Germany before, just to know what to expect and, and what are the challenges that face countries hosting these major events. And part of the work included going to the stadiums with FIFA delegations and looking at the construction, 
looking at the stadia being built from the ground. This is the Greenpoint Stadium I showed you, which was started construction with a big hole like this on the ground in 2006, and we saw it growing and becoming part of the landscape of Cape Town. Uh, it was completed. Uh, I don't need to speak much about that. It's quite a modern state-of-the-art stadium, uh, which uh, is, is among the top in South Africa at this point. So um, what the World Cup has left us with is this uh, uh, infrastructure of, of stadia, that being in Durban, near the beachfront, Johannesburg with the downtown uh, in the backdrop, and, and the Cape Town one situated right at the center of the city. And uh, I like this picture because um, these major events are about people. And uh, we realized that the people that had visited us, our shores, despite some of the uh, skepticism, actually found that South Africa was a place that um, was worth visiting. The other effects of the World Cup is uh, the infrastructure upgrades that we actually experience, our airports, our public transport systems, things which world cities are dealing with and which I think when you do mega events like these, you've got to make sure that there's some investment that you leave for the benefit of the country and of the people. Um, this is just actually an opportunity to see, to show you how the stadium sits in relation to Cape Town, that is what we call the City Bowl. This is the Atlantic Seaboard. And uh, it's quite a, an interesting kind of landscape, uh, that Cape, Cape Town setting. But uh, let's come back to what I think some of the challenges that architects are facing. One of them is the fact that this is a country that has got quite big gaps between the rich and the poor. You still find that. Um, the cities of Cape Town, or basically settlement in South Africa, is based on the suburb model, where you have quite affluent living areas. And behind those high walls I show you are quite well designed, at times quite um, kind of Hollywood style buildings. Uh, this was a particular designed for quite an affluent client um, that wanted quite a, an elaborate house. And uh, this house was overlooking the, uh, the, the, the sea um, uh, on the Atlantic seaboard. You can see that we did a, uh, a 3D modeling where you can actually, from the lounge, have an indoor-outdoor situation overlooking downtown. And uh, you had to maximize, obviously, the views that the, the, the place offered. And at night, uh, have the opportunity to open up and have a view onto the city. And I mean, this is what uh, the architecture of the rich actually expresses. And this you find in Cape Town, you find in Hollywood, up the mountain, Beverly Hills, everywhere. This is architecture we do, architecture we can do. But um, I always ask myself that, is this what really uh, South Africa is about? Um, South Africa is, 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 in my opinion, an amazing country, uh, which obviously surprised the world by reaching a peaceful political solution. And I've already mentioned that our cities are based on the, on the suburb model, where you have suburbs for the rich, suburbs for the poor. And the rich obviously being privileged uh, with the leafy, well-manicured settlements that uh, they uh, are able to afford, whilst the poor still live in shantytown environments. Uh, we call these townships, and I'm going to take you uh, on a journey through what one is confronted with, with the townships. And I, I therefore like to pose the question, um, what kind of architect you know, can undertake work that requires some sensibility with regard to uh, the architecture that addresses social imbalances? And, and, and what kind of teaching of architecture can achieve this, actually? These are landscapes that we normally refer to as townships or shanty towns. You go to the outskirts of Cape Town, you're going to find that people still live like this. Uh, Jeffrey worked 
for an architect who actually uh, does social housing. In fact, she worked with my wife uh, before she joined me. Um, and uh, the issue here is how do you deal with this environment and what can architecture do to address these challenges? Um, and these are usually very congested environments where basically you find that people, there's an informal economy happening there. All people want is to be able to um, have a means of living to sustain themselves. So you find that people sell whatever they are able to sell. And uh, you have stalls everywhere, very dense environments, shops which are made of any material that people can get. And some people have become very ingenious in that they actually sell you almost a prefabricated check so that you don't have to go and look for material yourself. You actually can buy a shack and go and position wherever you found a piece of land. And, and this is the kind of setup you find there. And in these uh, such situations, you actually find that kids don't have places or facilities where they can grow, where they can unfold. Some of them are not at school. And uh, you, you, you have to deal with the situation. Uh, play areas, urban playgrounds, as I call them, uh, are on concrete. Uh, not the kinds of environments which I think kids uh, actually can grow up uh, uh, and, and, and become what they would love to be. They are actually stuck in this environment. And um, what happens then in these environments is that because of the health conditions, the challenges, you find that um, sometimes fires break. And uh, we, 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 on this particular day, I was just driving past and I just took out my camera and uh, had to record um, uh, what was happening. In this I just had to capture this because these were people that were actually desperate uh, at that moment and um, these shacks were just burning and um, I just stood there and, and was saying now as an architect what do you do in a situation like this when you build uh, for people like this how can you respond really I'll let it run and uh, we'll go to the next line. It's very short, it's going to end just now. Um, now, obviously, in, in that environment where there are no facilities whatsoever, you, 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 oh, you, you have to use whatever means you have as an architect to provide facilities. This I, I, I like to show because it's the first project I did in Cape Town when I came back from Germany. I mean, not worth mentioning, really. But the interesting thing about it is that as an architect, what means do you use when you don't have budget to work with? So here we use color, really. This was a, a youth center in one of the townships where somebody decided that in order to accommodate the youth that were on the streets, he wants to just convert a shed that was standing there into a youth center. So we basically use color for this. Um, and South Africa is very multicultural, so you find that there's a lot of Muslim community, there are African people, and off late, there are actually people from the rest of the African continent converging to South Africa because this is now the country that is stable, is democratic, and people are just flocking there because it's also quite an industrialized environment, so there are lots of opportunities there. Uh, some of the work we do um, is in the township areas, uh, building schools, public schools. And again, I mean, from a design perspective, uh, this might not be earth shattering in any way, but what do architects do when, in fact, uh, you, 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 you are 
confronted by an environment of complete uh, underprivilege. And, and, you know, the public schools also don't have huge budgets, but you, you work with color, you work with trying making the classroom environment kind of uh, enabling. You try and, and use simple things like allowing as much light into these spaces where kids can gather. You, you try and make that community feel that the school is something they can look forward to, that they actually are part of. Um, and you design the school such that the community can use it for its own gatherings. Um, and, and you use light as much as possible to make sure that you don't have you know, um, uh, dark and dingy environments. You try and use color because this is the only means you have. Perhaps you could use forms as well. But uh, that luxury we, we don't have because uh, these things have got to be put up. Now, one of the projects that I would like to share with you today is one that was a, a project of low-cost housing, which uh, I was part of, uh, architects invited to design a low-cost house. Now, housing is a big thing in South Africa. Government has decided that it is going to subsidize housing for the very poor communities. And, uh, <clears throat> but the way they go about it is that developers are, are asked to deliver housing for people. And in fact, you always find that no architects are involved whatsoever. So we were invited to uh, be part of a project that was turning this shanty town into a formalized housing sector. And in this competition, we were allocated this family. It was a pilot project of 10 houses that architects were invited. In fact, 10 groups of architects were invited to also contribute. Each one, hopefully, was going to have their own design, and we're going to have 10 different houses. But as life is, it is not easy to design a low-cost house with no budget. So we were the only firm that was able to come up with a solution that could be built and that was close as possible to the budget that was allowed. We built this house using sandbags and um, with a timber frame structure, which was going to provide the main structure for the building. You can see here they are starting to put up the timber frames, and at the bottom are these sandbags. How this happens is that we had the community of the beneficiaries of the houses being involved in the packing up of the sandbags. Now, Cape Town is full of sand, and you, you don't have to, to drive bricks from wherever. The sand is just there. So we worked with someone who supplies this timber frame structure and packed the bags, and you can see they are placed in one-meter centers, and uh, with the community being involved in the building and actually filling the bags, we actually recognize something that I believe South Africa has forgotten, that African people generally have always been building their own houses. They never wait for someone to build for them. So these were some of the things that we actually realized that mean quite a lot to people. Because when you go there today and you see how the people are looking after their houses because they put their own sweat in them. It's very different from any other subsidized house that they've, uh, others have inherited. And um, what we made sure was that the, the, the houses provide individuality, but also provide the families with as much possible opportunity as possible. We had very narrow sites 7.5 meters, now I don't know feet, I'm sorry, but maybe someone can translate that. Uh, the site was 7.5 meters wide and 15 meters long, and we had to do with that. So for us it was important that we try and maximize the use of that site as possible. So we chose a double story type of building so that we could reduce the footprint of the building and be able to have some outside play areas. We put a balcony on, on, on these houses, but uh, this was to provide the family with uh, a play space for their kids. But the, in reality, what we wanted to achieve was that uh, when the families had a bit of money, they would actually put a third bedroom there because we could not afford it with the budget that we had. So this is an element that 
uh, provide some kind of incremental opportunity. Uh, my mouse gets disappearing. An incremental opportunity where they can actually add a third bedroom. But the entrance of the house is tucked under this veranda type situation and is protected from the weather. Cape Town is wet and windy. So some of the things that make houses not even sustainable there is the fact that they are subjected to quite harsh weathers. And then in summer it is very hot. So all these kind of um, smart design principles that are applied everywhere, we found it important to apply them also when building for the poor. So we built 10 of these, which as you can see um, have been completed and, and families are actually living there. And um, I, I think that for me, it, it is those small contributions that make my work interesting, challenging, and fulfilling because when you see how the people receive the kind of intervention we are making in a very small way, you actually find that uh, there is much joy in, in this kind of work. But um, there are other projects that are of interest also in the township areas for the World Cup. Nike wanted to um, uh, build a football training facility for youth. This was in the township of Soweto in Johannesburg. And uh, this project was quite an interesting collaboration with Nike designers and brand <laughs> managers. Uh, we worked between Canada, Portland, Oregon, Cape Town, and Johannesburg. It was a collaboration which was most incredible for me. And um, it is a, a youth center that is focusing on youth um, and it was opened just before the World Cup to provide a football training facility, <coughs> state of the art, with the most uh, 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 diverse uh, facilities, not only training but also education, because Nike is quite big on youth education against HIV and, and, and getting the youth not only to look at football as a sport, but to also develop them, their personalities. So it is, it is one of the projects that uh, I believe also was meant to make a contribution to improve conditions of total uh, underprivilege. Um, we, we, we're proud of this building. Um, we've just recently heard that it has been nominated as uh, among buildings that are considered for World Building of the Year. We built this in five months. Now, for a country like South Africa, which has got challenges with technology and, and the standard of building, um, it was quite a, an achievement to sit with Nike designers who wanted quite an outstanding building, but having forgotten that we're building in Africa. But to actually achieve this in a five-month period, I found that quite outstanding, personally. Um, these are just some shots of, of, of the building in the context of Soweto. It's got a roof deck uh, where you know some other programs of Nike can be held on, on the roof. Uh, these are change rooms that were uh, converted from existing buildings at the back. But Nike is very strong when it's brand management. Anything that Nike does has got to have a certain signature. And uh, we, we're fortunate to, to have been part of that um, experience. Now, this is just the internal uh, layout of the building. As I said, um, it's got meeting rooms, it's got educational rooms, they provide computer training facilities for kids to be able to learn computers whilst they are um, uh, doing football training, but also they are educated uh, on, 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 on education against AIDS and HIV, uh, but they are also um, given opportunities to learn the skill of football. From a professional point of view, they are given access to all the modern ways of training uh, uh, to be uh, professional footballers. The other project which is very fascinating for me, um, Cape Town is, uh, has participated in the bid to be the World Design Capital 2014, and we are asked to look at the rejuvenation of a particular part of Cape Town, which is quite um, 
at, at the moment it is quite dilapidated actually, it is falling apart. So we were asked to put together a temporary facility that is going to be an incubator. Um, this part of the city is called the Fringe or the East City. It is near a, an area of Cape Town that had been uh, where there were forced removals because of the introduction of apartheid, where people were moved from this place. So it is an empty space that used to have a thriving uh, 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 settlement and, and living environment in the 50s. But uh, because of apartheid that wanted to leave the city to become a place for white people only, they removed these multicultural uh, living environments. So we're asked to use a, a temporary facility uh, to create uh, an incubator for artists and, and young entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, this project has now been included in the Cape Town Build for World Design Capital. And here, the idea was to convert this area into an artist district. Um, and um, where innovation, design, and creativity were going to be nurtured. So we put this uh, container community uh, center, which is still in planning, but we hope that it will be just a generator for development. It is not going to be there permanently, but um, we've looked at how one can use these facilities uh, to start something that will turn this place around. And, and obviously using architecture, temporary architecture, to achieve this. The other interesting project which I'd like to mention is a, a peace center for Bishop Desmond Tutu, who has turned 80 and is retiring from, 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 from public life. But he wants to leave a legacy for the kind of uh, beliefs that he has and the contribution he has made to peace in South Africa. So this is a project that is uh, also currently in planning, and um, it is meant to give a lasting legacy to those who've contributed towards peace, and to actually um, represent all those in the world who are working to um, create an equitable world order. Now these are projects for me which uh, characterize the work that I do, the work that we do, the work that architects um, have to deal with, because the other work is great, it happens. Uh, people do have opportunities to do great buildings. Um, I, I believe that um, architecture for me is about how do we use our art, our creativity, and our craftsmanship or craftswomanship even, to intervene in particular environments. And I think uh, schools of architecture in South Africa in particular um, have got the challenge to produce the kind of architect who has that sensibility. And I believe that this does not mean that design is not at the center of it. I believe that design is actually the way in which you can intervene because Design in its broadest sense um, you know, provides you with um, aesthetic so solutions. It provides you with determining form where you work. It, it helps you to determine spaces which are occupied by people and that they have to respond uh, to, to, to the various needs that people have. So for me, uh, that is all part of design and that is what I think architecture and architects have to respond to. Um, I th also think that um, any trained architect actually has got the ability to do the kinds of work that uh, is required in these environments. But I also think that <clears throat> we've got to, I'm saying this because South Africa also is a country where design is not so well appreciated. We come from a country where engineers are running the show. This is how um, our cities were engineered to be the way they are, where the inner city is some 40 kilometers from where people stay. People have to travel in and out. 
that's all engineering that has created those environments. And the standard of design and appreciation of design, um, perhaps now it's starting to, to be realized. The embassy building we did, and there are a few other projects like the Constitutional Court that uh, was completed also at the beginning of the 90s. Uh, there are a number of projects that have really started to address a different kind of architecture, where architecture is not political, but where architecture articulates how a particular political environment can be interpreted and make architecture accessible to people. Um, I believe that if you work in South Africa and you're not sensitive to those realities, perhaps it's your choice, but in my world, I believe that architecture has got quite a big role to play because if I look at where I come from and, and, and had architecture not being accessible to certain people because of a particular political uh, thinking of the time, I wouldn't like us to go back there and I would like the kids of today to be having those opportunities if they want to be architects, they should be, whoever they are, wherever they are. All I can do is to actually create an environment where architecture has got a social side to it, has got social sensibility so that we can deal with the imbalances uh, of the past. So in my travels, um, it has been mentioned before, uh, I happened to meet the ubiquitous Mr. Gary, and uh, we met at a, at, a, at a conference. We were sharing a design panel together, and having the ubiquitous in Cape Town, I had to do something. So I arranged a breakfast uh, with my staff, uh, and it was one of the most memorable uh, breakfast sessions we've ever had because Firstly, he didn't quite know what we wanted from him because he was on holiday, but he had this uh, invitation. And um, we kind of persisted to get him. We said, we'll come to your hotel. You don't have to move anywhere. We'll come to your hotel, book the whole breakfast place, or at least to accommodate 20 people. And uh, it is those things for me as an architect, opportunities that you just should not let pass because through that meeting, through that breakfast, today I'm speaking at the SIARC, and I, I thank him greatly for, for that. So as I conclude, um, South Africa, I started by saying, is a very um, special country, which has had um, a very difficult political history but um, it is individuals and people who have tried to introduce change, and I'd like to be one of those architects who are associated with redefining the role of architecture in that country. Thank you very much. No problem. That's what I'm there for. Given the history and the class divide of South Africa in building, in setting up all the different World Cup uh, stadiums, was there a, uh, a plan for what to do after, after the World Cup when everyone leaves? I mean, or is what's um, What's the uses of the stadiums now? This is my question. Okay. I'll take two or three questions at a time. Was being South African a significant advantage in working with the community? Or do you think that people from outside would equally serve that community? Noted, thanks. No other questions? I can take those two, no problem. Um, the first question, uh, well, perhaps, you know, could be asked to the government. <laughs> but uh, I'll say that um, one of the things I've learned, having been involved with the World Cup in South Africa, but also having been involved with the World Cup in Germany, 
but obviously as an observer to, to learn about the World Cup, was the fact that countries you know, bid to host these mega events because they see them as an opportunity to not only benefit from the focus that these events bring, but also to create an environment whereby people um, can believe that there is physical uh, advantages uh, that you know are left behind uh, for the country. And um, now, again, I have to talk about sport in South Africa, where soccer was always seen as a sport for black people, rugby, cricket, tennis, and all these other great sports were sports for white people. The World Cup had a particular uh, angle to it, whereby soccer was, is the biggest sport because black people happen to win the majority and they happen to play soccer. And uh, the feeling was that the facilities for soccer are actually so uh, underrated and actually below par that it would be difficult to develop soccer in South Africa. So one of the reasons why the country participated in the bid to host the World Cup was to develop football. So soccer as a sport was going to be in focus to actually start uniting the country as well. So um, obviously one of the big problems of hosting these mega events is the fact that the requirements, whether from FIFA, from Olympics, all these international bodies are actually much more than any country could ever uh, afford, actually. Same with South Africa. So the stadia um, were much bigger than we would normally need. There is no question about it. And um, the plan, obviously, was that we're not looking at the four weeks of the World Cup, but we're looking at the next 20 years, where we're looking at developing the sport. In fact, if you look at the demographics of South Africa and you look at what kind of sports facilities we have, most of them are owned by rugby uh, organizations, which means that for soccer to be played there, there has to be an agreement with rugby people. They call the shots. And the government felt that soccer is the biggest sport in terms of numbers. Most of the township areas Soccer is the livelihood of the kids there, but they don't have the opportunity to develop. So the stadia are being seen as the opportunity to provide an environment whereby soccer can start growing. And I can see this happening. First year after the World Cup, our local league has become so exciting that in fact in Cape Town, where a conscious decision was taken to build the stadium in the city, you now find white people going to watch soccer, something they never did before. So these are things which, you know, maybe history will prove us it was right or wrong, we don't know. But these are things which at the moment are being seen as part of nation building, where the government has invested a lot of money in infrastructure, stadiums, but also has been forced to improve public transport, to allow people to access this data, but not only this data, but to actually have a network that the country needed. So what the World Cup has done for us is to accelerate development, which could have taken us 30 years, but it had to be condensed in order for us to host the World Cup and make sure that when people come, they actually can access the stadiums and, and watch the World Cup. So from that point of view, I would say that is a plan. Some cities, um, are still having problems of how to manage a stadium like this. It's a new phenomenon. And some of the stadia are not doing well, but I believe that it's a matter of time. Um, I know that most of the cities are going to various countries that have hosted these events, that have got these kinds of stadiums today are major, major investments. So you've got to have a good business plan to be able to run that stadium efficiently. But one thing I can tell you is that there's no stadium in the world that is profitable. 
that does not happen. But it becomes quite a challenge for a country like, a, like South Africa, which has got quite a, 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 a strenuous economy in terms of dealing with those facilities. But I believe that next 10, 15 years, we'll be talking a different story. And I think that they are going to benefit the country and benefit the people, especially when it comes to sports development. Second question around the Sandbeck House. The architects that were invited, interestingly, uh, each architect was grouped with an international architect. So basically, for these 10 houses, 20 groups of architects were invited. I was paired with uh, Will Alsop from England, Britain, quite a celebrated architect there. Um, but our approach to the project was very different. Um, in fact, um, I mean, Will is a colleague, you know, but he had a solution sitting in London for Cape Town. And I thought we would also collaborate in the ideas in how to approach the, 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 the brief. Um, so within a very short space of time, we were not speaking the same language. And, and we could not agree on the approach because I believe that if you're going to try and intervene in a township situation in South Africa, firstly, you've got to understand who are you building for? How do the people live? Uh, you know, what are the dynamics of the family? This family that I was allocated was a family of eight people, two adults with six kids. And I had to build a house for them for about $8,000 because that's what that house, that's what the budget was for that house. And the government subsidy um, provides for that amount of money um, for a 40 square meter house. That's the regulation. But realizing the challenge of having to accommodate eight people and being fortunate enough to have found this sandbag construction system, um, I was able to build a 54 square meter house much larger than what government allows, but also because I'm using a building system that you know, is easily uh, accessible to people where the community also contributes its own kind of labor to, to build, um, we could kind of mitigate a lot of things and get people involved in the solution. I had to convince them that building a sandbag house is going to give them just as dignified a house as any other house. And in fact, we had to, uh, w w when we started investigating what sandbag construction does, it improves the thermal performance of the wall so much that on the hottest day in Cape Town, when you get into the sandbag house, you get a 15 degree temperature difference because that is the quality of the sand. And when you saw the video of the burning shacks, sand does not burn. It would not burn in, in, in a situation like that. So all these things, the, the choice of materials, the approach to the, to the problem, and to get the people involved, was trying to solve many problems with very simple means. And, and I believe that this is what we as architects should be doing. We should be asking questions and, and not just allowing to just be satisfied with the conventional ways of doing things, but to find new ways. So we, we treated this project as a research project, really. And, and by now, um, we, we would want to believe that we could even improve on it. And we, there will be other materials we find. That is, we don't believe that's the only solution. But in this particular case, we found a solution that could meet our needs and address the need of building houses that are, are dignified, that are decent, and that are of good quality. You go to those houses today, there's no crack, there's no moisture, there's nothing, because this is how the material we've chosen performs. There's another one. I just have uh, one question. Uh, the question is about uh, politics in architecture. Uh, 
concentrating on the rich and the poor. In South Africa, it is a big problem that you have poor districts and you have rich um, districts. My question is, is, is the problem now uh, accommodating for the poor or is the, is the um, a kind of a, is the solution trying to, through architecture, finding a link between poor and rich? Uh, just your thoughts about that. Okay. Any other? There's another question there. Uh, just as you mentioned, in some places, uh, people don't really appreciate architecture. And uh, maybe in uh, Cape Town, some poor, uh, poor people zone, um, they don't care about uh, the beauty of architecture and they cannot uh, defer architecture from engineer, uh, engineers. Uh, so uh, do you think when the poor people or the people who don't care about architecture get involved into an architecture product, uh, do you think architecture have the capability or responsibility to uh, enhance or change the lives of the uh, those who don't uh, who don't care about architecture, or uh, we need to uh, change ourselves to meet the needs, uh, which is in the same direction with their lives? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Is there another? I, I was interested in the townships and, um, and Frank Gehry actually used corrugated metal in a similar way on his first house. But, uh, I was wondering about how property works in uh, the townships and like, how you pick where, where your um, property is and like, ideas about property and um, land in the townships and <clears throat> how architecture can uh, be a part of that if it's sort of a mobile sense of property. Okay. Um, first, the first two questions I think are, are linked um, and, and I'll, I'll try and tackle them uh, accordingly. I do not think that I would say that in South Africa specifically, architecture is dealing with the issues of rich and poor per se. Uh, all I'm saying is just that architecture has a role to play. We are about creating spaces. We are about creating buildings. We are about creating environments. It's about us, our sensitivity in our actions that will help transform those environments to believable environments. That's all I'm saying. And I'm just saying that the rich can afford anything, but architecture has got to be sensitive whether you're building for rich or for poor. Up to now, no care has been given to environments of poor people. And I believe that architecture can play a role to improve those conditions. And, and, and if you say it's about getting poor people involved in architecture, no. It's about what am I doing as an architect when I intervene in those environments? And, and that, that's what it's all about. Architecture has to be able to intervene in environments that are challenging. It's, I don't believe architecture is about glamour. And this is not to say the successful architects that are building great buildings, whether it's Bilbao or whatever, are actually doing something that I think is not good. All I'm saying is that if I'm put in an environment where I must build in a township situation, how do I respond as an architect? How do I treat the people I'm building for? How do I understand them? How do I create an environment where the architecture I do there responds to the challenges that 
are prevailing there. That's all I'm saying. And I think, you know, um, maybe the question is more profound in a country like South Africa where there's been this very violent history of oppression, of racial discrimination, where race plays a big role, and, and where architecture has been also used to actually express this kind of racial thinking by denying access to black people, for example. So I think it's just about taking the question and saying, what can architects do in those environments? And how can we improve the conditions there? And how can our buildings start dealing with that challenge? And um, it is not different when you build for projects that have got good budgets or big budgets. You still use those same design principles. And I think that we as architects are challenged in our country or in countries like ours to deal with the specific situations. African architecture, I was in Tokyo the other day at the UIA, which is the International Congress of Architects. And um, <clears throat> one of the architects who was speaking there, David Ajay, he's a British Ghanaian architect. And when asked what he thinks African architecture is, he said you probably would have to be more human and less commercial because it's, it's about the lives of people and it's about creating environments where people can you know, express their way of life in the buildings and environments that we create. So it's not about saying we want poor people to be involved in architecture. Great if that is possible, but the question is what do I do as an architect in that environment? And how do I even make the teaching of architecture sensitive to those realities? Um, property in the townships, difficult question. Um, there are no real rules of, of land tenure. For example, the people who own the 10 by 10 houses, Sandbeck houses, um, they've received them as grants because they are part of the subsidy program. Um, the land is owned by the state, really, and they are essentially owning the properties on top. So one of the challenges we're having when you deal with poor people, you can ask Alejandro in Chile, one of the issues around building for poor people, how do you create value for them so that they can actually, uh, just as you do, I own a house which until I pay the bank out <laughs> is not mine but belongs to the bank, but at some point it is value for me. And as you know, that property always increases in value. For people in the township, that does not apply because they do not have the same property rights as, as you would have in a normal market situation. So these are the challenges that, how do you then really create value for those people? Can one use that house to get a loan from the bank? Probably not. So the, the property issues I think that's another discussion which unfortunately I can't answer because it, it deals with the property laws of the country and, and which laws apply to poor people and to people who can afford to buy their own property. Thank you.